Hello and welcome everybody to another Tuesday afternoon program with the Genealogy Center. I am super excited to have Melissa Barker, the archives lady, here with us today to talk about creating your home archive, right? So what does that mean exactly for us? So our speaker today, Melissa Barker, she is a certified archives manager and a public historian currently working at the Houston County, Tennessee Archives. She is mostly known, uh, affectionately known, as the archives lady to the genealogy community. So she lectures, she, she teaches, she writes about genealogy research processes, uh, researching and archives and preservation, which is what she's here to talk to us about today. So she has a lot of really awesome experience and I'm really excited for her to share all of this knowledge with all of you. So without further ado, I'm going to disappear and let Melissa get started. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm going to share my screen and we will get started. Um, we are going to talk about being the home archivist, uh, preserving your family records um, like the professionals do. Uh, yes, you can do this from home. And as you can see, my presentations will have a lot of visuals in them. I'm a visual learner. And so the two that you see on the screen now, the one on the right is actually a photograph of a collection of records um, that we received here in our archives, the Houston County, Tennessee Archives and Museum. As you can see, this is a manuscript collection. We're not going to be talking about in depth about manuscript collections today, but I think it's one of the most underused records collections uh, that genealogists just don't seem to know a lot about. And that's an example of what you can find in a manuscript collection. The photograph there on the left is actually um, a photograph that was taken while I was attending the Archives Institute when I was to become a certif a certified. Uh, the, the hands on the farthest part uh, out of that photograph are my hands. I'm actually working on the Tennessee Supreme Court records. We got to do that while we were in class. So great things being an archivist and um, knowing that genealogists collect records and have original records, it also makes you an archivist. Genealogists, I believe, are home archivists. And so many times when we receive records in an archives, we receive them from genealogists. And hopefully these records are getting taken care of so that when they come to us, they don't need a tremendous amount of work um, and we can actually archive them fairly easily. So what are some of the uh, differences or some of the sameness about genealogists and archivists? Well, we both collect old records. Uh, archivists obviously collect old records, whether those are county records, um, a college or university archivist might collect old records. At the state archives, genealogical societies, historical societies collect old records. But we also, as genealogists, of which I've been a genealogist for 32 years, we also collect old records. We collect them from our family members who give them to us. Maybe we inherit them. Uh, and so we're responsible for these records and they've been entrusted to us. Another similarity between genealogists and archivists are we preserve those records, those photographs, those artifacts for future generations to enjoy. So we as genealogists, if we have all these original scrapbooks and diaries and old letters and records, we should be preserving them so that our future generations can enjoy them, uh, whether that is in our family or they get donated to an archive. Now, I know many of us as genealogists have children and grandchildren, nieces, nephews that are just not interested in genealogy. But I wasn't interested in genealogy as a young person either. I did not get interested in genealogy until I was about 21 years old. Uh, and so it will come. Hopefully there is someone in the family that will take it over from you. Uh, I am the only one in my family. So people in my family send me photographs, send me documents. They just drop it in the mail without telling me it's coming and it'll just show up. So I think maybe you all have experienced that as well. Another similarity between genealogists and home archivists are we share information and records with researchers. So as an archivist, that is what I do. I enjoy when genealogists come into my archives and ask me about researching their family and they're looking for records. Well, we as also as genealogists, we love to connect with those cousins out there. No matter how far away they are from us, no matter how far down the line in our uh, family tree they are, we wanna connect with them and hopefully we wanna share with them and we want them to share with us. And so the only way that we can do that is if we preserve the records that we have so that we can share with others. And I would encourage you to share um, your records online on, on some sort of an online database or a family tree because people search for that. And if they find you and they can connect with you, then maybe they have something you don't. 
And so I'm always encouraging people to share. Another way that genealogists and archivists are the same is that we love the stories that our records tell. Um, one thing that you may find when you come to my archives is you may find me actually doing research because a lot of times we will run across records or documents that make us think, okay, wait a minute, we need to know more about this and we'll start researching. Um, I have several projects that are ongoing right now, uh, on particular things having to do with my county here in Tennessee uh, that I'm actually continuing to research because of a document or a piece of information that has been found. And genealogists, aren't you just the same? We always love the stories that our records can tell. Now, sometimes the records that we have generate more questions than they do answers. Um, I recently, in the last week or so, received some records from Washington, D.C. From, from the Civil War court martial records because my husband's ancestors were court martialed during the Civil War because they uh, left their regiment. And when I received those records, of course, they generated more questions than they did answers. So now I have to continue to research. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about a dedicated working space. Then we're going to talk about original order. Original order is one of the first fundamental things that we learn is when we become an archivist. We're going to talk about a home archivist toolkit. And yes, I'm actually going to tell you what to purchase to make your own toolkit. Then we're going to talk about binders, folders, and boxes, different ways of organizing our records. We're going to talk about unfolding and flattening records. This is a question I get all the time as an archivist from genealogists. We're going to talk about cleaning records and removing hazards. We, uh, the ladies and I talked about this before we came on, removing hazards from our records. And lastly, we're going to talk about record storage and climate controls and then consulting with the conservator. So that's a lot to get to. So let's talk about a dedicated working space. In the archives world, we have dedicated working spaces, whether that is a desk, whether that's a large table, or that is a workroom. And so um, you as genealogists, wherever you live or wherever you do your genealogy or work on your records, you should also have a dedicated working space. Now, I understand that not all of us can live in an archive, and so it may just be the corner of your kitchen table. It may be your dining room table. It may be the bed in your spare bedroom. Wherever you have chosen to work on your genealogy and to work on your family records should be a dedicated space for you. And you should treat it as such. Uh, and here in the archives, we have dedicated spaces for many reasons. And we're going to talk about those. Uh, the photograph you see here is actually of Miss Ann Sykes. She was one of our volunteers for many years. And this was her space. And sadly, she uh, unexpectedly passed away several years ago but we remember, remember her quite fondly. You need to have your home archivist toolkit at the ready, and we're gonna talk about that toolkit here in just a second. And the reason why you need such a toolkit is because as you're working on records, you need certain tools and they need to be right there with you. And, um, and so we're gonna talk about that. Working at a dedicated workspace, I'm also going to encourage you to work on one collection of records at a time. Now, as a genealogist, when I work on my genealogy research, I usually work on one ancestor at a time. And the reason I do that is because sometimes you work on more than one or you're working on lots of boxes of records, you can get very overwhelmed very quickly. I don't know how many genealogists I have had that tell me I have got so much family stuff, I don't know where to begin. And so paring down your collection, working on a few things at a time so that's taken care of and then moving on to more is something we need to be looking at. I know people have said, I've got boxes and boxes of pictures. I don't know where to start. Well, my first thing is to tell you, pick out 10 pictures. I don't care what 10 pictures they are. Take 10 pictures out of the box, close that box up, put the box away, and just work on those 10 pictures digitize them, I try to label them, uh, share them with family members, put them in archival sleeves and archive them. Once you've done that, then you can pull the box out and get 10 more. So it's a slow process, but it is one that will help you. And this one kind of gets everybody. Uh, at your dedicated working space, and this is what we do in the archives, clean up your space at the end of the day. And this is gonna do two things for you. Uh, when you clean up your space at the end of the day, it's going to help you if you have forgotten to put something away, if it's still laying on your desk. Um, also, when you come back to do more research or to do more preservation, 
your space is already cleaned up. You don't have to clean it up before you get started. There is nothing worse than having to come to your desk and have to clean it up first before you can even do anything. So if you clean it up when you get done at the end of the day or at the end of the work time, then when you come back, you're gonna be even more eager to get going. So we do that in the archives. We clean up our space at the end of the day so that the next day when we come in, we're ready to get started. So next I wanna to talk to you about original order. Um, and once you see what this is about, you'll understand because I get questions about this all the time. So the Society of American Archivists defines original order as a fundamental principle of archives, in which it is. Um, maintaining records in original order serves two purposes. So first, it preserves existing relationships and evidential significance that can be inferred from the context of the records. And this is important for us to remember, especially when we're dealing with family records. And second, it exploits the record creator's mechanisms to access the records, saving the archives the work of creating new access tools. So original order, let's just say your ancestors or your family members have given you boxes of records. And as you're going through those records, you're trying to decide what to do with them. Well, first, before you do anything with them, you need to look at that box of records or look at that scrapbook or that diary or those old letters as they are, as they were given to you. Were they put in some sort of order, uh, such as chronological order? Um, maybe they were put in a certain kind of order. And you need to pay attention to that because then the order may help you tell the story as you read through those records. If you take the records and jumble them all up, you may miss something in what your ancestors or family members meant to pass on to you by messing up that original order. Uh, and especially this in photo albums and scrapbooks. Um, those I find a lot of times are put together in a particular way. So we need to pay attention to that original order. Um, and I can't go any further without talking about this photograph. Um, a few years ago, I had a couple of sisters walk into our archives and they were carrying two boxes like this. This is just a photograph of one of the boxes. And they proceeded to tell me that their mother was in the nursing home and they were cleaning out their mother's home. And they were on their way to the landfill to throw these boxes away when someone told them that Melissa at the archives might be interested in them. So uh, when I got to looking at them, I quickly realized that these were binders of genealogy research and it represented about 50 years worth of genealogy research their mother had done. And they were not interested in them at all and they were gonna throw them away. And so I had to keep them because if they walked out the door, they were going to get thrown away. I quickly realized that these surnames had absolutely nothing to do with Tennessee. And so over time, I've been trying to locate an archive that we might can send them to. So these binders are probably in um, some sort of order, original order that the person put them in. And so that's something we need to pay attention to. So boxes of records may have been packed a certain way for a reason. And we're gonna talk about two, maybe there is no reason, but we should look at this before we just dive right in. We, keeping original order can help us to tell our ancestors story in a particular sequence. Um, I don't know how many times I have gotten a box of records and I look through them and I've been able to see why it was packed the way that it was or why this scrapbook was put together the way that it was. Because once you look at it and you see the story that it tells, there's a lot more to it. And so for our ancestors, a lot of times we have to read between the lines or read between the pages of that scrapbook, of that diary, of that photo album to get the full story. So next we're gonna talk about organizational methods. Now, before I talk about organizational methods, you must know that there are as many organizational methods out there, I think, as there are people. Um, and so there is not one organizational method that's better than any others. Um, and so I'm going to talk about two today. And the reason I'm going to talk about these two is because these are the two that I have used. Now, I want to emphasize to you that whatever organizational method that you use, if it works for you, then keep using it. Just because I'm talking about organizational methods doesn't mean you need to change what you're doing. I'm just showing you a couple of methods that I have used, and especially if you're looking for a method right now. So you need to choose a method that works well for you, and what works for someone else may not be for you. So what, find what works for you and be consistent at it, 
Um, and so if you hear someone else is doing a particular organizational method and you want to try it out, that's great. But don't think because it's working for them that it's going to work for you. We've got to find what works for us. But whatever method you choose, the most important part is to be consistent throughout. Uh, you need to use that method throughout your genealogy research record organization. Uh, and so find what works for you and just be consistent. And use archival materials as much as possible. Things like acid-free folders, um, archival sleeves, boxes, and things like that. Now, I understand many of you who have gone to purchase this kind of material, it is very expensive. Um, it's about three times more expensive than a regular file folder or a regular page protector. Uh, and so it's sometimes it's difficult to purchase when you don't have the money to do that. And I understand that. So what I tell genealogists to do is go ahead and purchase that regular file folder. Go ahead and purchase that regular page protector or that sleeve because at least you're encapsulating your records and keeping them protected from the elements. And then as you can afford it, I would encourage you to purchase archival materials. So the first method we're gonna talk about is what I call the binder method. Uh, many of you may use this method and you may not use it exactly as I have, but you may use the binder method. And so this is where you have a three ring binder and you store all of your family's documents in them. You use document sleeves and then that organizes your genealogical records. So how I use my binder method is I labeled each of my binders with a particular surname. Uh, and you, like I said, you may do yours a little differently, but this is just how I did mine. So within each binder, the documents that I put in my binder were arranged by document type. Uh, and so between, uh, behind a tab, I would have birth records, death records, marriage records, census records for the entire surname in one binder. And sometimes it took up two binders. This is, I think, a great organizational method for beginners because it helps you get your records in one place for a particular family uh, quickly and kind of all at once. Uh, I use this from the time I started doing genealogy up until about 10 years ago, and it has worked for me. So if you're a beginner, or if you're not really a beginner, but just getting started with your organization, I would encourage you to try binders. Uh, here's an archival tip for you. If you're using binders, I would encourage you to lay your binders flat on the shelves, not up on their sides. Because if your binders are not completely full those uh, documents and sleeves can sag as they're sitting there, which means you're putting pressure on your documents and you may put creases or it may sag your documents, which is not good. The next method is the folder method. Now I moved from the binder method to the folder method about 10 years ago. The reason I did that was I found that my binder method was just not working for me. Um, and so many of you may be using the folder method now. And so what is different between a binder method and a folder method is it takes a whole binder full of records and breaks it down into individual persons or ancestors. And so this method, I, how I do this method, and like I said, you may do it a little bit differently, is I have a folder for each and every ancestor that I research. Now that's a lot for me because I'm one of those genealogists that I research anybody and everybody connected to the people that I research. And not only do I research my family, but I research my husband's family as well. Um, I'm a very avid genealogist. And so I have a file folder for each person. What I was finding was, as I was using the binders, um, when I was doing research, like I said, one ancestor at a time, when I wanted to look at the records for a particular ancestor, I had to pull out the entire binder for that family. And then I had to go find the birth record, the death record, the marriage record within that binder. So I decided to move to a folder method where I could put all of the documents for one person in a file folder. I put them in that file folder chronologically. So when I wanna research that person, all I have to do is pull their file and everything is in that file in chronological order. Many times these are gonna be arranged in filing cabinets or boxes by surname. So I have a filing cabinet 
And in my filing cabinet, I have uh, dividers or tabs, and those have the surnames on them. And behind those dividers are my ancestors for that surname, and I put them in chronological order by birth year. So archives actually use a folder method when they're organizing their vertical files collection. If you don't know what a vertical files collection is, it's a hodgepodge of records that are stored in file folders in filing cabinets. They're usually arranged by surname or subject name. And you can find literally anything in a vertical file. You can find an obituary, you can find a family group sheet, you can find a birth record, a death record, a marriage record, whatever has been pretty much donated to an archive that isn't large enough for a manuscript collection usually gets put into the vertical files. One of the downfalls of using the folder method is that you need to have room for filing cabinets or boxes because they're going to fill up. Just think about all your ancestors. And if you did a file folder for each ancestor, uh, your filing cabinets and your boxes are going to fill up. So these are the things you need to consider when you're looking at a particular organizational method. So let's talk about the Home Archivist Toolbox. And so get ready. I'm going to tell you some specific things that you need to put in an actual toolbox. And so the first thing, obviously, we need to purchase is a toolbox. Now, I don't want you to go out there and get one of those big stand-up toolboxes that, you know, is got wheels on the bottom of it. A little small handheld toolbox will be just fine to hold everything we're going to talk about. And you need to have this toolbox close to you uh, at your dedicated working space so that when you need something from your toolbox, it's right there for you. First and foremost, you're gonna put number, soft number two pencils in your toolbox. I'm asked all the time, what do I need to use to write on my documents and my photographs to um, document uh, and label the people or the information? Well, first and foremost, I tell people, try not to write on your documents and your uh, photographs. But if you need to, use a soft number two pencil. That is what we uh, suggest in the archives industry. And they are easy to erase. They're easy to remove if need be. Uh, but soft number two pencils get you a few of those to put, you, put in your toolbox. Now, there's going to be some instances, especially on some particular photographs, such as Polaroid photographs, and also there is a particular type of photographs paper that was used in the 1960s and 70s when it was um, developed, the film was developed, that has a slick coating on it, and pencil just will not write on the back of those photographs. And so this is, is something that you can use, and I would encourage you to use very sparingly. This is called an Identa pen, and you can purchase this at any archival store and even on Amazon. And it has, it looks kind of like a Sharpie, but it's not a Sharpie. Do not use Sharpies on your photographs or documents. But this needs to be used sparingly if you have one of those photographs that you just can't get pencil to show up on. It has a real thin end and a, a little bit of a fatter end, and you can use these on your photographs. It is archivally safe. Uh, you should have something like this in your toolbox. They're very inexpensive. I think they're less than $10, uh, but a great thing to have in your toolbox. Next is soft bristle brushes. You need to have some of these in your toolbox because you may need them at times. You know, we use them in the archives to brush off uh, surface dirt and soot. Um, if we're working with scrapbooks, there might be some dirt in, in the uh, binding that we in between the pages that we need to brush out. Uh, the soft bristle brushes are the ones that you need. Now, you don't need to go out and buy expensive brushes. Uh, just go down to that store where everything's a dollar and get makeup brushes. They come in all different shapes and sizes and they're very inexpensive. So just go down and get you some makeup brushes and throw some of these in your toolbox because you might need them when you're working with some of your records. This is an archives tool. Uh, this is called a micro spatula. Now, if you talk to any archivist anywhere, they're going to know about these. Um, they come actually shaped a bit differently. You can get different ones. The one there on the right is the one that I use all the time in our archives, and we use them. It's a multi-purpose tool. We use it for everything. We use it to remove staples. We use it to help us to handle documents, especially very delicate ones, especially if they're, you know, falling apart. But this is a micro spatula. You can purchase them at any archival store. You can purchase them at Amazon, but you need one or two of these in your toolbox. 
Now, um, when I was attending the Archives Institute, they encouraged us to actually talk to our dentist to see if they had any of their old uh, dental tools that look kind of like this that you may get him to give you some or maybe purchase very cheaply. I just don't think I want dentist tools in my toolbox. Uh, again, these are very inexpensive. You can purchase them. And I'm gonna show you in a minute um, how we use these. The next thing I want you to put into your toolbox are gloves. Now there's a controversy, has been a controversy over decades and decades in the archives world about, do you wear gloves? Do you not wear gloves? And so we have pretty much settled on the fact that for most everything, you do not wear gloves. The only time you really need to wear gloves is when you're handling photographs. Photographs, um, uh, you know, the dirt and the oils, even with clean hands, can get on your photographs. And if they're handled over and over, eventually can be detrimental to your photographs. And so we encourage people to wear gloves when you're working with photographs. Other than that, you really don't need to wear gloves because the reason being, and what we have found, is that when you're wearing gloves and you're handling documents, especially very delicate documents, you lose the textile sensation in your fingertips and in your fingers. And as you're handling that document, you really can't tell how you're handling it and you could actually cause more damage than if you um, are not wearing gloves. So don't wear gloves unless you're handling photographs. And gloves, what do you wanna put in your toolbox? You can get the traditional white cotton gloves. I will tell you that they will get dirty pretty fast. Uh, and so you'll need to wash them often or get new ones. But you can also get the uh, nitrile gloves, the ones you can use and then throw away. If you get the nitrile gloves, I would encourage you to get the powder free. Uh, they usually come with powder inside of them to help you put them on and take them off. But the powder is not archival. And if that powder gets on your documents or photographs, that would not be good. Um, if you're allergic to latex, they have latex free gloves. And so you can get a pair of one of each and put in there just to have in case you have to go and touch photographs from your family. Uh, so get you some gloves, put them in your toolbox. Next is something pretty fantastic. This is called a soot and dirt cleaning sponge. Now this is not a regular sponge you're gonna find in the cleaning supplies uh, at the store. This you have to get from an archival store. Uh, and it is pretty interesting. You don't add any water or any chemicals or anything to it. You use it just as it is. The picture there on the left, we get it in what is the, it comes in what is called a brick. And so as archivists, we will cut this down so that we can handle small pieces of it. And we use it to clean documents. <clears throat> this actually is owned, the, the recipe to this particular sponge I found out after doing some research, is owned by a particular company and they uh, guard it like the Coca-Cola recipe. Uh, and so they're the only company that makes these sponges. But these sponges will help you to keep your documents clean. Uh, you'll be surprised if you were to take a document that looks very clean to the naked eye and you use this sponge on it, um, that you will pick up dirt, whether even though you can't see it. So that's an example there on the right of a clean sponge and one that I used on one document that actually didn't look that dirty, but this is the amount of dirt that I was able to lift off. And these sponges are pretty interesting as they get dirty, like the one, the picture there on the right, what we will do as archivists is we will cut away the dirt and underneath is actually a fresh sponge. And so we use every bit of our cleaning sponges. Next, I want you to get some document repair tape. Now you're gonna hear me say that there is no such thing as archival tape because I'm kind of a purist that way. I don't want you to put tape on anything, but there is a particular type of tape out there called document repair tape. And you usually will see it in one of these two forms, the one on the left, the document repair tape by Line Co, or you'll see it uh, named Filmoplast. And these is, these are both archival tape that can be used very, very sparingly on small rips and tears on your documents to keep them from ripping and tearing more. So get you a package of this, uh, like I said, from one of the archival stores or from Amazon that's not too expensive. Um, a whole box is going to last you a very long time, especially if you use it sparingly like you need to. That's what's gonna go in your toolkit. Um, and if you go, go check the recording out, you can actually get all of this down and go to the stores and purchase it. You'll be glad that you did because as you're working on your records, you're gonna find that you're gonna need these tools. And this is what we use in the archives world. 
So let's go on and talk about unfolding and flattening records. I'm asked this question a lot, especially when it comes to old letters that are folded and still in their envelopes. And yes, we unfold and flatten as much as we possibly can. So the first step that archives usually take when processing records is we unfold and flatten records. Um, if you ever get a tour of an archives, which I encourage you to ask for, and you get to go into the workrooms, you're going to see a lot of archivists taking uh, letters out of envelopes, documents uh, that are being folded, and unfolding them and flattening them. And so you see here, there's a letter that's been taken out of its envelope, and it is still folded. Uh, sometimes they won't lay flat, and so we have to flatten them. We have to take steps to do that. And yes, keep the envelope with the letter. Uh, don't toss the envelope because there's important information on there. Even the postmark is in important information. And so don't get rid of the envelopes. So as you as home archivists, when you're working with your records, you should be careful to unfold and flatten your family documents. Try not to leave them folded in because what's gonna happen is, is the more they're folded and unfolded over time, they're going to actually destroy themselves. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. So the crease lines and the fold lines in documents that have been folded and unfolded will eventually fail, especially if you bring them out, unfold them, show them to somebody, fold them back up and put them back away. So that's why we like to unfold and flatten and keep them that way, put them in archival sleeves. So when you do handle them, you're handling them already flattened. So what's gonna happen is those crease lines, those fold lines, the more that they are stressed, they're gonna fail and your documents will literally fall apart. So archiving documents, which are flattened, they will less likely sustain damage. That's what we do in the archives. We flatten our records, put them in archival folders, put them in boxes. If they're very large documents or large maps, things like that, we have map cabinets. We have large cabinets that we put those in. Uh, and then as we show them to genealogists, if you've ever been to an archives that will bring you an oversized document or a map, they're usually flat. And when they show them to you, they're in a sleeve uh, and they put it on the table for you to look at. So cleaning records. We do this in the archives all the time. We have records that come to us that sometimes are very dirty. Many of the records, especially I work in a county archive, have been stored close to things that cause them to be dirty, such as an old courthouse where they had coal stoves and the coal stove, the soot from those, actually got all over records. Here where I work, we were, have been extremely fortunate that our records are not as dirty as some. I know that there are some archives close to me that their records were stored near a coal stove and their records were literally black with soot and they've had to do a lot of cleaning. Uh, this photograph here is an interesting one. This is what I call fresh from the attic. Um, this is actually a collection of records that were donated to us um, that belong to Miss Nina Finley. She was our county historian for decades, um, and her son called me not too long after she had passed away and asked me if we would like to have her research records that were in her attic. Uh, and so we said, yes, we would love to have them. And so this is just a picture of partial of the records. It actually took a couple of truckloads to get it to us. I did not realize there was that many, but we were grateful to get them. And as you can see, they are still in their original boxes in this photograph. We have since gone through everything. We've put them in archival boxes. Um, we found some, a couple of dead rodents. We found some dead bugs. So that's why it's important that we use archival materials. And we also pay attention to where we store our records, which I'm gonna talk about in more detail. So soot and dust and other grime could be on your documents. And that's why you have your archivist toolkit. I'm gonna to show you what you can do. So we need to clean our genealogical documents, but we need to be very gentle with this, with this cleaning. Um, and if it is, looks like it's fine that you can't see any surface dirt, then it might be okay just to leave it alone. But you need to use the right tools. And so that's why you have the toolkit. Um, I gave you all the tools you need to clean your records. I gave you soft bristle brushes. Remember me talking about those? You need to have those in your toolkit. These are great for brushing off surface dirt or getting the, the dirt and the grime that's in between the binding in a scrapbook or a diary, things like that. These are fantastic for that. You need to get the ones with the great big heads on them that are very soft. 
because you don't want to cause any damage. And here's our cleaning sponges um, that should be in our toolkit. Uh, we're going to use these, especially on documents that are very dirty, but also on documents that might be just a little bit dirty. But we need to be careful on how we use those. So here's how I explain, which is kind of difficult to do without showing it to you. But here's how I explain to clean a document. You're going to put your document on a flat surface. Then you're going to put your hand in the middle of that document. This is going to stabilize the document because when you take these sponges and put them on the document, you're not going to scrub. You're not going to swipe across the entire document. You're going to work in small spaces at a time. So having that hand in the middle of your document stables us, stables it. So you're going to use the sponge and you're going to start in the middle of the document and work your way out slowly in very small portions out to the edge of the document and cleaning it. You're going to work in small areas at a time. Again, you're not going to scrub and you're not going to do large swipes across the entire document because you will tear your documents. Do not use these sponges on pencil writing um, because you will absolutely erase the pencil. I can tell you that a joke that the archivist played on us when I was attending the Archives Institute is they handed all of us one day in class, they handed all of us documents that were all written in pencil. We thought they were original documents. Turned out they weren't, but they were trying to teach us a lesson. And so they handed us all cleaning sponges and asked us to clean the document as we had been taught. So as we started cleaning these documents, all of us started gasping because the pencil writing was being erased. So they taught us a very good lesson to not use cleaning sponges on pencil writing. So let's talk about removing hazards from our documents. Did you even know you had hazards on your documents? Well, you do. And as archivists, we spend a lot of our time removing these from documents. So anything that is metal is a hazard to your document. Now, this is a box of paper clips, um, probably staples, rubber bands, which we're going to talk about rubber bands specifically in a minute. And this box is about a month's worth of pulling these things out of documents. They accumulate pretty quick. So anything that's metal, we want to remove from our documents. We also want to remove rubber bands from our documents. Uh, maybe you have some rubber bands around a stack of old letters. Maybe you have rubber bands around something else. But rubber bands are very, very detrimental to your documents. You also want to remove as much tape as you can from your documents. Now, you may find that that tape has truly adhered to the document and it's very difficult to remove and you're scared you might damage something, then you want to leave it alone uh, because it can actually get more damaged worse. But if it is able to be removed, we need to do that. Here's an example of what happens when a piece of tape is put on a document and left there. The tape has been removed. But as you can see, there's still a yellowish brown stain on this particular document. Luckily, we can still see through that stain to what the writing is underneath, but this is what tape will eventually do to records. Here's some examples of some things metal that we have found in the archives. Um, going way back, you might find staples, obviously, paper clips, all kinds of different kinds of paper clips straight pins. For some reason, there was a period of time where people used straight pins for everything. Uh, grommets. Um, if you have legal documents that have grommets in them, we actually still, we try to remove those because they can rust. Hairpins. Uh, people like to use hairpins. They People like to take anything that can attach two pieces of paper together and use it. Um, binding clips and any other metal fasteners. We really want to remove those from our records. These are actually um, more modern day type binding things that people have put on records. And you might find a lot of these in legal records. Uh, these are binding clips um, and things like that. We don't wanna use these. Even if they say stainless steel, I have a lot of people will say, but it's stainless steel, it's not gonna rust. I have seen many stainless steel binding clips, paper clips be left in a building where moisture got to them. And yes, they rust. This is what happens when they rust. This is, as you can see, where paper clips have been. They were exposed to moisture and they rusted. But what you don't realize is that rust will start eating away at your paper. 
once you get rust on something, if you do not remove it, it will start eating the paper that it's on. And so this is not what you want to see. Now, in this case, it did not, it um, wasn't detrimental to any of the writing very much, but this is not what you want to find for your records. Um, here is how we use our micro spatula. This is one of those tools that should be in your toolbox to remove uh, staples. Um, we do this in the archives. What we do is we turn the paper over. And as you can see in that photograph, that is a rusty staple. We use the micro spatula to lift up what I call the legs of the staple, turn the paper back over and put your micro spatula un underneath the head of the staple and pull it out. Um, trying to remove staples can be very damaging to your documents. That's why you need to do it slowly, methodically to remove it. We do not want to use these types of staple removers, um, the claw staple remover and the wand staple remover. They can be very, very damaging to your records because you're yanking these staples out. And if you really don't know what you're doing, you can cause a lot more damage. Um, I've seen the claw staple remover, but it hasn't been until recent years when I was up in one of our county offices that I saw one of our, the secretaries using this wand staple remover. And I was shocked at how damaging it is. So try not to use these. So we're gonna talk about removing things that bind. Now, believe it or not, I have found all of these things in records in my archives. So rubber bands, um, like I said, people like to put rubber bands around things to bind them. Twine, I have found twine and rope. Um, I have found shoestrings used to, to bind things together. Hair ribbons. Now this one's gonna be a little bit differently. You may have hair ribbons wrapped around some love letters and we don't wanna throw away that hair ribbon because it's part of the history. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And band-aids. Yes, I have actually come across two documents that were put together, bound together with band-aids. They must have just not had anything else. So you just never know what you're gonna find. So these types of things are things that bind our documents together. Uh, they are gonna bind them in such a way that they are, could be very damaging. Uh, binding records like that actually breaks down the fibers in the paper. I mean, our documents are already deteriorating naturally on a, on a daily basis. We do not wanna help that along by adding things like uh, rubber bands and things that can bind and actually hurt those documents. Rubber bands are very interesting. If you've ever dealt with rubber bands, you know this to be true. Rubber bands will deteriorate and they will deteriorate very fast, but they will deteriorate either one of two ways. They would deteriorate to the point where they get become very brittle and when you touch them, they literally fall off the documents. That's what you want to find. But the other way is that they would deteriorate to the point that they become very sticky and they will adhere themselves to the documents. That is something you do not want because it is horrible to have to deal with. Here is an example of that. This is a rubber band that has gotten stuck to the document. And I had to use our micro spatula to literally chip away at that rubber band to get it off of there. And it still left a yellowy orange residue that we could not get off, not even with the cleaning sponges. So this is why we don't wanna use rubber bands. Um, anything else like rope, uh, twine, anything that you see like that, just remove it um, and uh, no reason to keep it unless that you think it has some historical significance, but let those documents be as they are and not be bound up like that. Now, hair ribbons, we talked about that. If you have hair ribbon wrapped around a stack of old love letters, you want to document and you want to archive those love letters and you want to include the hair ribbon because the hair ribbon probably belonged to one of the authors or one of the recipients of those letters. And so include the hair ribbon in an archival sleeve with the letters as a family keepsake. <clears throat> so let's talk about tape um, and removing tape. It can be very difficult. And in fact, it can be so difficult that many times we don't try it. Um, this particular newspaper clip that you can see has tape on it. And the tape itself has deteriorated in such a way that it has literally melted into this piece of newsprint. And we have actually left it alone. We put it in a sleeve and we have archived it. Yes, we could probably reach out to a paper conservator. They probably could get it removed after some time and expense. 
But in this case, this is actually, we have the newspapers actually for this clipping, but we, um, we just decided to leave it alone. So tape is like rubber bands. It's gonna do one of two things. It's become, gonna become so brittle that when you touch it, it literally falls off the piece of paper or off the document. Or like I just showed you, it will become so sticky and gummy that it, it adheres itself to the document. So um, if the tape has adhered itself to the document and has become gummy or like glue, it honestly is best to just leave it alone or to contact a conservator, which we'll talk about here in just a second. If you have tape, believe it or not, that has attached two pieces of paper together, like they would use a staple, but they use tape, simply cut the tape in the middle. If you can remove the tape, great. If you can't, then just leave it alone and, and archive it. So I've told you what's not safe to use. So let's talk about some things that are safe to use. Plastic paper clips. Now, first and foremost, I would encourage you to not use any kind of a binding instrument on your documents. But I understand you may have some very important records that they need to stay together. And you're worried that one piece or one page may get separated. So you can use plastic paper clips. Um, I would encourage these kind. The ones on the left there are totally plastic. Um, the ones on the left, on the right, are actually plastic coated paper clips, which are the metal paper clips that have been coated in plastic. Um, but I would actually encourage you to use them very sparingly. Try to put your documents in folders or in sleeves so they stay together and you don't have to use paper clips at all. Archival tape. Remember me telling you there was no such thing as archival tape? <laughs> well, there really isn't in my book, but I understand that there are times when you have small rips and tears in documents that you don't want to get any worse. And so using this archival tape will be something that's good for that. So again, this should be in your toolkit. And if you come across a document that has a small tear or a rip in it, you can use this, but please use it sparingly. Um, and when you do use it, put it on the back of the document or where there's no writing on the document. Um, as you're gonna see here in just a second, you can see through this tape, you can see writing, but it's always best not to put it where the writing is. So for severely damaged rec uh, records or documents, photographs, I would encourage you to reach out to a conservator. Um, and we're gonna go talking about that in a minute, but this is what it looks like when you use the archival tape. As I, as I said, you can see through the tape, um, it can mend a small rip and tear and keep it from getting worse. Uh, but like I said, if you take this same document and put it in an archival sleeve, that archival sleeve has static electricity. And so it will close together with that static electricity and it will stop that rip and tear from getting any worse without using archival tape. So there are other options. This is an example uh, uh, that I tried. This is a test that I tried. This is a document. Remember me talking to you about folding and unfolding your records. This is an example of a document that was folded and unfolded so many times that when I picked it up out of the box, it literally fell to the floor in pieces. And this is exactly how it fell to the floor. Um, and it's just literally in pieces just from folding and unfolding. So I decided to do an experiment and I took the archival tape to see if I could tape this back together because it's pretty severe. So I took the archival tape, taped it back together as best I could. Uses the, this is the document repair tape that I used. And this is how it came out, not too bad. And as you can see, um, I actually used a lot of tape on it and you can read through it, no problem. There are some missing pieces. This is from over time where little small pieces have been, um, have come off and are now missing. Uh, so you can do this in extreme circumstances and it comes out pretty darn good. So let's talk about record storage. You know, no matter what you do with your records, if you put them in sleeves, you put them in archival boxes, uh, you do all those things properly, you use all the right tools. If you still don't store your records properly, um, you're still going to have to battle the elements. So I would encourage you not to store them in an attic, basement, or a garage. Uh, these are not um, temperature controlled, they're not humidity controlled. They're not places to store records. Now, I also understand that that's probably maybe the only place you have to store records. In that case, I understand. Maybe put them in plastic 
bins or tubs so that the elements can be uh, stay away from them. We want to store our records in a dry environment off the floor. Uh, and when I say off the floor, mainly because I'm talking about flooding. When you leave your home for a vacation, you never know what's going to happen in your home. Just like here in the archives, when we leave for the day, I always encourage my volunteers to pick up boxes that are on the floor, put them on the table or on a chair, because we never know what's going to happen in the building while we're gone for the night. Store records in an area where the temperatures are consistent and do not fluctuate. That's the most important part. Um, your temperatures, you can't live in an archive. Uh, many of us go to archives and libraries and we have to take our sweaters because it's so cold in there. Well, it's because they have the temperatures down because they're trying to keep the deterioration of the documents from getting any worse. Well, you can't live in your home with those cold temperatures, but what you can do is you can put your thermostat on a particular temperature and leave it there. The taking the, the thermostat and raising it really high and dropping it really low over and over is what's gonna cause your documents to have some damage. And keep all of your records out of direct sunlight. Direct sunlight has damaged more records and more artifacts than really anything else. If you're one of those that have um, framed all of your original photographs and documents and put them on your walls or on tables and that sunlight is hitting them, I would encourage you to make copies of those originals and display the copies. Because I have literally seen writing on documents washed away from sunlight and I've seen images on photographs literally disappear because of sunlight. So we need to watch how the sun is hitting our records. Climate controls. Um, like I said, not all of us can live in an archive. I get to work in one. But in an archive setting, we try to keep our temperatures between 35 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the colder the better, actually. And I know that you can't live in your home this way. So just remember to keep whatever temperature you set your thermostat on, just keep it consistently at that temperature. Humidity levels. Um, I live in the South and humidity levels can really bother us. Uh, so in the archives world, we keep our humidity levels between 35 and 50 percent. Uh, we use dehumidifiers in each of our rooms and we check them often. Um, and usually in the summertime, we have to empty those about once or twice a week. In the wintertime, it's usually about once a week. So we need to choose our humidity level in our homes and just keep them at that same humidity level. Like I said, the temperature, humidity, when they fluctuate greatly is when you're gonna have problems. So those consistent temperatures and humidity levels will your documents, your photographs, your artifacts will thank you. Um, you can actually purchase one of those little control, uh, climate control devices that will help measure um, and you can check it. They're very inexpensive. Um, put them in the area where you're storing your records and check it periodically to make sure that the temperature and humidity levels are staying consistent in that storage area. This is what you do not wanna see. This is uh, mold growing in a damp area. This is an extreme uh, case of it. But if you have boxes of records stored next to this, that mold is going to get on your records. And mold is a living, breathing thing. Uh, and so it grows and it grows very fast. And if you have mold on one document, you're gonna have mold on all your documents. So you need to make sure that you keep this from happening and keeping your temperatures and humidity levels consistent will help with that. That's what we do in the archives. Um, I have people come in and they'll say, oh, it's cold in here. And I say, yes, it sure is <laughs> because we wanna keep it cold in here. So those records don't deteriorate and also so the humidity levels, we don't start getting mold. So lastly, we're gonna talk about consulting with the conservator. So even archivists consult with conservators because we can't handle everything that happens in our archives. So if you don't feel comfortable repairing your documents, or if you have something that is an original, that is something you want to preserve, then reaching out to a conservator is important. So when you have photographs and artifacts with extensive damage, something you just don't feel comfortable in handling um, and you don't know how to handle, then that's when you need to talk to a conservator. If you have rare documents or hist extremely historical one-of-a-kind documents, even if they have small amount of damage, I would highly encourage you to not handle it yourself, but to reach out to a conservator. 
because these records may be worth money, but they also may be so extremely historical that um, what you might do to them may not be the best. So where do we find these conservators? Well, first and foremost, I would encourage you to reach out to your state archives, wherever you live in the United States, because all 50 US states have a state archives. And almost all of them have a conservator on staff. Now at the Tennessee State Library and Archives in Nashville, Tennessee, that's my state archives, Emily Farik is our conserver, conservator. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that they probably can guide you, they can direct you, they can answer your emails, but most likely they will not do the work for you because they work for the state archives. But what they can do is they can give you advice and they can also give you maybe a name and contact information of a conservator in your area. Another place to go is the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. It is a website. And on that website, they have a page that uh, tells you all the conservators in a particular area. So you can look where you live and look to see which ones are available. Their contact information is there on the website. So my parting advice to you is do not do anything to your records that you can't undo. And this is where I tell people to not laminate. <laughs> you notice I did not bring up the uh, subject of laminating documents in this presentation. It's because I don't like to talk about it. Back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when laminating came on the scene, archivists thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread, even at the National Archives. They started laminating everything, even some of our founding documents, they started laminating. Uh, move forward a few decades and they found out that laminating is one of the worst things that you can do to a document. So now they are delaminating everything, which is a very arduous process. So don't do anything to your records that you can't undo. Thank you so much for attending this presentation. Please visit my blog, A Genealogist in the Archives. You can also find me on Facebook. Just search for The Archive Lady. And if I don't get to your questions today, if you have another question, please email me at melissabarker20 at hotmail.com. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Elizabeth for any questions we may have. Hi. Okay. So there are a lot of questions. There's about 40 of them. So we're going to try to get through as many as possible. Sure. Uh, some of your questions are actually quite similar. I'm going to group your questions together as best I can. Uh, but if we don't get to all of your questions, yes, definitely send Melissa an email, send us an email. Her email is in the handout, which yes. we've been sticking in the chat throughout the program and my colleagues will throw it in there a couple more times. Great. So to get started, um, mm -hmm. Oh, this is a good one. So I just brought home my mother's five-year diaries, 20 or so volumes from uh, 1945 through this year. Okay. Uh, how do I store them safely in my home? So storing diaries specifically and a lot of diaries. <laughs> what a lucky person. Uh, my ancestors did not leave not one diary. So I'm very envious. Um, go through them, look through them, make sure that there's no metal in them, that she didn't staple something inside there. Um, a lot of times in diaries, diarists will actually tuck things in there like theater tickets or programs from a grandchild's, you know, play or something. If she's done that, uh, what I encourage you to do is to take those items, put them in an archival sleeve and stick them right back where you found them. Um, and then I want you to take each diary and I want you to put it in a box, an archival box, but I want you to put a piece of archival tissue paper in between each diary. Because if they are leather or if they are um, some sort of um, plastically leather or whatever, if they get exposed to any humidity, they could, could stick together. And so put that archival tissue paper in between them and then just store them in a cool, dark, dry place. But I would encourage you also to read them Read them for uh, pieces of information about your family, um, maybe even some local history, national history, what did they experience, uh, but read them and enjoy them. Great. Uh, so how would you find an archive that would be willing to take films, photos, scrapbooks, et cetera? Oh, I get that question all the time. Um, and I will tell you that our archives uh, nationwide, worldwide are getting full. 
And so you have to work with them, contact them, let them know what you have. Uh, a lot of times our archives have guidelines on what they'll take and what they won't take. And a lot of times it's based on space. So talk to them. And also there's probably more than one archive in an area. There might be a county archive, a historical society that has a building with records, a genealogical society, um, the state archives, a library. Um, so try all of them uh, and just talk to them. Main thing is just talk to them. Find out if they accept what you have. If they do, they're probably gonna ask you to sign what's called a deed of gift. A deed of gift actually is where you are handing over ownership of whatever you're giving them to them, which means they don't doesn't belong to you anymore. Uh, but just you need to just uh, talk to these archives and find out what they take and what they don't take. Speaking of uh, films and like negatives and whatnot, uh, someone did ask if negatives that have foxing should be segregated out of a collection of negatives. Um, yes, that's true. Um, unless you can get it um, restored by a conservator or something, and, and then you can actually put it back with the collection. But uh, yeah, you should be very aware when you're working with your collections to look at each and every piece, each and every document to make sure that whatever damage or something that like they talked about should be segregated. Yeah. Great. Okay, so there are, I'm going to start grouping some questions together. Uh, there were a lot of questions about how do you get things that are stuck together, whether they are documents, photographs, yeah. scrapbook pages, how yeah. do you get them unstuck? Oh, and someone also asked about negatives as well. Um, you know, a lot of times this happens when there has been flooding, and there's been a lot of flooding yeah. in the last few years in our country. Um, there's actually a county near us that um, about a year ago, actually experienced some major flooding. And so you find that that gets into their homes and as their your photographs are, are found, they're stuck together. Well, one of the things that happened, one of the things that we do and the state archives, first of all, reach out to your state archives because sometimes they can offer um, some emergency help with things like that. But one of the things I encourage people to do with things that are stuck together actually is to put it in the freezer. Because many times if it's stuck together with moisture, that moisture will freeze. Um, and many times they'll come apart. You can pop them apart. Um, uh, that's one thing that archives will do is they'll put things in the freezer immediately to freeze them. And then they sometimes will come apart. Now, one thing I also get asked the question about getting photographs out of photo albums, especially those black paper photo albums. First and foremost, I would encourage you to leave your photos in a photo album, except for those 1970s magnetic albums that are those sticky albums. Those are albums that archives, archivists love to hate. But you can take um, um, dental floss and try to use that, go between the photograph and the album and see if they won't come off that way. But if you have things stuck together because of moisture, put them in the freezer, freeze them and see if they'll come apart. Great. Okay. So there are also a number of questions about the filing system. Um, you know, should you put duplicates, like duplicate information about certain ancestors um, to replicate? Do you mm -hmm. replicate in another ancestors folder, which they're referenced? So yeah. like, yeah. Um, it depends on what it depends on um, what you want to do, honestly. Yeah. Um, me for, for me, I know how I work. I know when I go looking for something, how I work. And so, yes, I will duplicate census records, make copies and put one in each of the person's folder that's in that census. Now, if you're the type of person that you can just like put a note in a file that says that the census record for this family is in this person's file or make some kind of notation and you could follow that and you keep up with that that would be great too. Um, but I'm the type of person that when I pull that person's file, I want everything there. I don't wanna to have to go be looking again in someone else's file for a census record. So yes, I make copies and put one in each person's file. So when you label your folders, do you, how do you label it? It's like last name, first last name? name? First name, middle name, if they have one. And then under that, I put their, I uh, put born and their birth date de uh, that I put died their death date. Then I put spouse and their spouses, if they have more than one. And I put their parents' name on the label as well. Oh, nice. It's a lot on a label, but I want, when I go to look for it, I want it to be right there. 
Right. It do what makes sense to you. I mean, my yes. aunt just has been sending me her files and there's, I think in another life, she was an archivist or librarian because <laughs> they're all organized by, by couple, by married couple. Mm -hmm. They are numbered and they oh, are yeah. color coded, color coded. I can, you know, I could never, I could, I could never wrap my brain around the color coding systems that are out there. But if that's something that you can do and that you understand it, then yeah. you it. Yeah. Great. Uh, all right. So we are running a little short on time. So I'm going to see if I can group some more of the kind of similar questions together. A lot of questions about handling like really musty documents. Uh, there were some people asking about the sponge. I put a link to yeah. the one, the Absorine dry yeah, clean sponge from Gaylord yeah. in there. Okay. Yes. So that, that's the one that you use. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, questions about things like mouse poop. When you find mm. that in boxes. Yeah. So what do you do when you find the really nasty stuff, right? <laughs> the things that we probably shouldn't be yeah. breathing in. Well, you can wear a mask. You can wear gloves yeah. uh, first and foremost. But then, but if you find it, then get it cleaned out, transfer whatever is in those boxes to an archival box or to archival sleeves, get rid of it completely. One of the things that I like to tell people that you may, you may not know, um, but this comes from my years of, I, three years, my husband and I owned a restaurant and we would get deliveries with cardboard boxes of our, you know, food and things like that. And people don't realize the um, bugs that come in with cardboard boxes. And so if you get shipments from Amazon, if you have things in your closet stored in cardboard boxes, you need to really get rid of those and you need to get archival boxes or even plastic tubs. Now, someone asked, has asked about plastic tubs. Yes, the plastic will off gas. And they will eventually, over a period of time, could damage your documents. But sometimes that's the only thing that we can afford to do. And so it's good to use those plastic tubs instead of cardboard. You said something about musty smell. Yeah. If you have documents or let's say a scrapbook or diaries that you have received and they have got that musty, moldy smell, put them in a plastic tub. And put a little, I put a dish of cat litter in there with it. Seal it up because that cat litter will remove that smell. Um, another thing you can do too is if it's, if you know that it's moldy smell. Um, remember me telling you not to put anything in sunlight. Well, in this case, I want you to put it out in the sunlight because sunlight will kill the mold spores, but only for about 30, 45 minutes. And then bring it in and put it in a container with the kitty litter, or you can get those silicone packs that we get in a lot of different things. Save those, put those in there, and it should draw out more of that smell. So if you have mold on something. Yes, yeah, so you need to put it in sunlight, direct sunlight, because yeah. first you have to kill the mold spores, because I told you mold is a living, breathing thing. Yeah. Great. The last question before I set you free, Melissa, but just final thing, reminder for everybody, do send us an email if you would like a copy of the chat, if you have questions, send Melissa an email as well if you have questions and follow her blog. There's a lot of really, really great articles in there. Uh, so the last question has to do with tape and glue. How yeah. do you get it off? <laughs> do you, do you well, get it off <laughs> well you, you can try but i'm telling you that if it is really sticky and gummy you're not going to get it off and i would advise you just to leave it alone you can you can reach out to a paper conservator um they're they're gonna it's gonna be very expensive for you to remove it so it needs to be a very special document you want it removed from but like i said unless it's obscuring some writing that you really need to know uh, i would just leave it alone great and for all you people who've been asking about flattening records, archival weights, Google it. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the archival weights and time. Um, I just take my documents and put them down there. I put a piece of archival tissue paper over there. I use books. I use heavy books and put them on top of there. Go back, check it in a week or so. If it's still not flattened. Leave it alone for another week or two. Very easy. Yeah. Be patient. Like everything yeah, else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Melissa, for such a wonderful yeah. presentation. People are super excited to watch the recording again later. Yeah. Uh, it will go onto our YouTube channel. Just give us a little time to edit it. Uh, but thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And I hope all of you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye.